and welcome to the manga edition of Spoiled by Beth. I don't know why I feel like I just stepped out of an anime, but I do. Maybe it's because I was a huge fan of Sailor Moon when I was younger and she was meatball head. And I mean, I'm, I'm missing the long ponytails, but I've got the meatballs pretty, pretty well done. But this is what happens when your girl doesn't feel like doing her hair and just wants to try something new. But today is not about my hair care. Today, my book review is about Kathy Golke's Secrets She Kept. Like so many of my book reviews, I'm very excited to get to this one. But this one is a little bit different than some of the others. I did love this book. Let me put it out there. I loved Secrets She Kept. If you saw my review of I Have Lived a Thousand Years, then you know that I have just an affinity for Holocaust stories. And so this one fell right in there and I loved it from the beginning. However, I checked out this book initially with like seven other books and then before I could finish them all, I mean like almost at the very beginning of when I got them, I got a job and I got an internship. So that meant your girl had no time to read and I, I did, I kept checking them out. You know, your first checkout you get two weeks and then you get two more checkouts. So I had this book for six weeks and I just could not find the time to read it. When I finally did start reading it, I wasn't able to finish it before I had to turn it back in and I was devastated because I was so, hooked. I wanted to check it out again and read it, but I am a realist, guys. I know when something is achievable and that was not going to happen. So I sucked it up and I spent the money on an audiobook and I don't regret it. It has a, a dual narration at first. I thought it was the same girl just doing both, but it's actually two narrators. And I, I, it's not that I didn't like both of them, but I thought one was better than another. But we're not going to get into that right now. This is all just a very long-winded way to say I love this book, but it took me a really long time to finish. Let's get into it. This one, unlike I Have Lived a Thousand Years, is fiction, but I thought it was just as impactful, if not more. But what they had in common was that they showed us life after the camps, which is something you don't get a whole lot of. Let me not get ahead of myself. The The crux of the novel is the, the main character. Well, technically there's two. There's two main characters. There's Hannah Sterling, who is in the 1970s, and then there's Lisa Lotta Sommer in the 1930s, 1940s. So what happens is Hannah, when you meet her, she's kind of combusting at work. And her boss says, you know what? I think you need to take some time off. Basically, she does. Like she, it's it's the 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 winter holidays, so she just kind of leaves a little early, and she doesn't really know when she's gonna go back. But we learn that her problem is her mother had recently died, and she didn't have a good relationship with her mother. But her mother's death has still had a major impact on her, basically because she felt like there was so much left unfinished between them. And we do learn that her mother is Lisa Lotta. As she's going through her mother's house, she learns that her mom has some documents in a bank vault. And from the letters that she finds in the safe deposit box, she learns that she might have a living grandfather in Germany. Her dad is gone, obviously her mom is gone. She never really had a relationship with the grandparents on either side. And so she just sees this as a really great opportunity to, to meet a family member she didn't know she had, and then hopefully learn more about her mother, kind of figure out why her mother was the way she was, what brought her to the United States. Hannah, she goes to Germany, and she meets her grandfather, and she meets her grandfather's really creepy friend, Dr. Peterson, and it's not the warmest of welcomes. There was a, a maid, not a maid, there was a housekeeper. There was a woman there that took care of the house, cooked the meals, and uh, Hannah was realizing things weren't right in the state of Denmark. And so she was trying to ask things of this housekeeper and the housekeeper was like I cannot talk about it 
and it's largely in relation to Hannah's mother. And somehow, the grandfather found out that Hannah had been talking to this housekeeper. And the next thing she knows, the housekeeper's gone. And so, you know, you just get all these little clues that something is being swept under the rug. I'm just going to jump into it. What we learn is that the grandfather, Herr Sommer, he was a Nazi. And Dr. Peterson was as well. Or maybe not necessarily Nazis, but Nazi sympathizers. And what they had done was they sold Jews to the Gestapo under the guise of getting them papers, getting them passports to escape Germany. So what they would do is they would accept money, they would accept the goods, turn the Jews over, and then keep the spoils for themselves. Now, by the end of the book, the grandfather, he's not doing well. He had a stroke, he wasn't doing so great. And Dr. Peterson was like, I wanna buy the house. By this point also, Herr Zomer had left everything to Hannah. And so it was basically up to her discretion as to whether or not she should leave the house to him. From my understanding, he only knew about the money. I don't know if this money is the money that was given to them or if this money came from the receipt of goods that was then exchanged for money. But what he did not know about was Herr Zomer's hidden room full of the, the trinkets, the paintings, the silver, the whatever that Herr Zomer had kept. And so at the end of the book, Peterson is like, he's doing whatever he can to get to this house. Hannah is trying to do everything she can to get him out of the house or to keep him out of the house. And in the end, he is caught breaking in and he is hauled off to jail. And Hannah, kind of through the course of this as well, she has been trying to return the goods to people. And this is one of my favorite parts. Early on in the novel, when she arrives in Germany, she is met by a driver named Carl. And Carl, over the course of the novel, sheds light on the fact that just because the war was over, just because Germany and the Nazis lost, did not mean that it changed people's minds, did not mean that Jews wanted to be known as being Jewish. And so as Hannah is trying to return these goods, because she realizes that that's the right thing to do. That's the only way she can pay penance for what her grandfather had done. And so as she is trying to track down the owners of the, the stolen goods, he's like, hold on, wait a minute. These people might not want, like one, they might not want their stuff back. And two, they might not want you to try to give them their stuff back. Because one, you're an American. They don't know you. Like, and so it's just really interesting. Because if you saw my review of I Have Lived a Thousand Years, one of the things that that author did that I'd never even thought of was she addressed life after the war, life after camps. And that is something that Golke really expanded on. And it, like, you know, in I Have Lived a Thousand Years, it, it hit me for the first time <laughs> that we Americans are not the almighty savior. And just because we came in, we liberated the camps, we ended the war, did not mean that everything was hunky-dory afterwards. Like, in I've Lived a Thousand Years, the Americans came in. They don't speak German. They don't speak Hungarian. They don't speak Polish or Dutch. They liberate these prisoners, but they take them somewhere, drop them off with a bag full of stuff, and then leave. And it's like, what, what are we supposed to do now? There's a lot of confusion. In The Secret She Kept, you see that it's that same kind of feeling towards Americans that, yeah, you may have liberated us from camps, you may have done this, you may have done that, but we don't really trust you, you're not one of us, we don't know what your intention is, are you really American, or are you some underground Nazi who is coming out of the woodwork and is going to do something to me? And so 
I just thought it was super interesting to see the reactions that she got from these people. They were scared or they were angry, angry out of fear, angry out of sadness. And it took three people before Hannah was like, I guess I should let the authorities take over. So it made me wonder what, what would I have done? Because I felt like she gave up kind of fast. But if I had to have a complaint about this book is there was a lot of buildup. And then I felt like the resolution was a bit quick. But so we get to these three people, at least that's all we see. We see three people that she has tracked down with Carl's help. And by the end, she's like, you know what, Carl? I don't want anything else to do. Like we will hand it over to the rightful authorities and they can find whoever else and blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, so, because my mindset would have been the same way of, this isn't my stuff. Like somebody in my family did something wrong and now I need to make up for it. And I, I don't know if I would have tried to do it by myself. I probably would have gone through the proper channels just because it's a daunting task. But I was like, Hannah, for someone who is so determined to, to do this, like, you let them scare you off pretty quickly. But maybe it's just a scary situation because like, in the 2000s, we're how many generations past World War II? But in the 1970s, that's only 30 years. Not as much has changed as we would have thought. And so maybe it was scarier. Maybe the reception she had was just enough that she was like, I'm not prepared for this. Especially there was one guy, her the, the last guy, he was the only surviving member of his family. And so they go to where he's staying and he just has a fit. Like he's throwing the rings that she brought him and he's just yelling at her and he's being really harsh. And, but I understand it was that, the whole idea of like, this was my life after the war. I had a family and I saw my entire family die and I'm the only one who comes out and now you're bringing me something to remind me of them. It was just, it, I, 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 it, was, it was gorgeous, it was beautiful guys. Like this is just a really emotional novel in terms of like, it's not explicit. Like it's not as gory as a lot of the, the nonfiction titles that you'll read, but it definitely gave you a sense of how the war impacted people. In terms of how quickly Hannah was ready to give up, I was like, it was a little unsatisfying for me. So she ends up just essentially going home. Like all these scenes, bang, 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 and then she's home and I'm like, what? But the thing is, you know, after she, her grandfather dies and all this gets sorted out, she had, during the process, been looking for someone who knew her mother or grandmother because there was a question as to her paternity. What she learned was that her father, and just huge spoiler, her father was not her father. Her father was an American GI who somehow married her mom and brought her to the States. And so she's like, well, who is my dad? We're all under the assumption that it's this one guy named Lucas who in Lisa Lata's timeline is the boy she's in love with. But she just wants confirmation. She wants to, to find someone who can tell her who her dad was because her dad, her mom never mentioned it. And so she, Carl, you know, she's had this, this argument with Carl because partly all the stuff surrounding finding the owners of these goods. But also, this is a faith-based book. In my opinion, anything that revolves around the Holocaust is to an extent because Jews were being persecuted for their heritage, for their faith. So anything surrounding this, like I think it makes sense to include God, but the whole book Hannah has kind of been wrestling with her faith. And so this is just another point of contention with her and Lucas because 
she just there's so much she doesn't understand in regards to to God and the Holocaust and how things could happen and why people think the way they think but he finds somebody who had been in a camp with her mother and then this woman has recently become a bestseller because she wrote about her experience and then this woman is just telling Hannah you know I was able to forgive can you and there we go there we go there we go so that's kind of Hannah's journey is she has issues with her mom she learns that her grandfather's still alive she goes over there there's a lot of tension um, eventually she puts on her big girl pants and she starts standing up for herself which is another thing I don't really get I felt like she was so meek and then all of a sudden she was just willing to stand up for herself like as soon as Herr Zomer made her the inheritor of his will and all of his assets she was like all right well it's all mine so I'm gonna do things the way I want to do them I don't know and then she discovers the secret room full of stuff. She goes on this journey to try to return it. Things don't go her way. X, Y, Z. She goes home. That's Hannah. Lizalata, when we meet her, I want to say she's like 13 or 14. Her mother is dying from cancer. She has a crush on this boy named Lukas Kirkman, who is her brother's best friend. And she is not the girl we're expecting her to be. She is not the girl that... Hannah portrays as her mother and so now we're like what is it that changed Lisa Lata Sommer? The Kirkmans, well uh, Frau Kirkman is half Jew. Her mother whom she never met because she died in childbirth was a Jewess and so by virtue of that fact Frau Kirkman was supposed to go to a camp but they were able to kind of cover this up because her her stepmother was not Jewish nor was her dad but because of things that were said in front of the wrong people <coughs> Dr. Peterson he does some digging and he's like all right we got to get rid of these people in the meantime Lisa Lata has become very close with Frau Kirkman not only because she was there for her mother when her mother was dying but because she was there for Lisa Lata in the aftermath you know, and she's in love with Lukas, and she's best friends with Marta. This is also during the time when the Nazis were coming to power and when the boys and the girls were supposed to be parts of those clubs. And so Lisa Lata's dad is getting very involved. Her brother is getting very involved, but Lukas is not. You know, he's being excused for various reasons. And, but this is creating a rift between the two boys. They're just going in different directions. And by this point, we don't know why Lukas has an aversion. Anyways, Lisa Lata's brother ends up going to war and he dies. Herr Zomer, he, you know, this is something else I thought kind of went unfinished. He starts courting another woman and they are supposed to get married. It doesn't happen. You know, we know this. Hold on. I have a sneeze. So we know they never get married from the present, but in the past, it's never explained to exactly what happened. Uh, at some point, Lisa Lata and Lukas do get engaged, but it's also around this time that Dr. Peterson uncovers the truth as to Frau Kirkman's parentage. And so he and Herr Zomer set it up so that the marriage cannot happen, but then Lisa Lata discovers their plot. She overhears them talking about how they are going to sell out the Kirkmans. And so then what she does is she inadvertently takes Marta's place. She ends up in a concentration camp. And I don't know if it's all of this or, or what, but somewhere along the line, Herr Zomer's engagement falls apart. We, 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 the fiance actually seems like a decent person. I wasn't really sure how to read her at first. Like, you know, where, where did she stand on like Germany's purification? You know, like where does she stand with the whole Jewish thing? 
in any case, that marriage never happens. It's never explained really why, and I thought there was such a big deal made out of it that it needed to be tied up, but whatever. So, yes, back to Lisa Lotta. So now she is in the camp. She overhears her dad and Dr. Peterson. She runs to the Kirkmans, and she's like, you're in danger. They're going to sell you out. We need to go hide. So they go to this church. They get married. Um, the whole family hides. And then in the morning, they are captured. What we learn is that over, I, I don't know what the period of time is, but Lisa Lata had been helping Jews. So the, the Kirkmans were part of this church and the church was doing its best to help Jews escape. And so she and Marta would kind of be the runners. They would deliver food, they would deliver food stamps, they would deliver passports, they would just keep people safe. And somehow, I don't know who it was, like there's there's no indication to any of this to how any of this really works. It's just all of a sudden kind of dropped on us. Her dad figured it out, her dad or maybe Dr. Peterson or somebody in their, I don't know, their circle, their organization, their whatever, followed at least Lisa Lata, knew her route, knew the hiding places, and this is how Jews were being found. So this is how she and the Kirkmans were found. They're carted off to, well, the women were taken to Ravensbrück. I don't quite know about the men. I think maybe it was Dachau. But so she is immediately separated from Lucas. And then, so now she's at Ravensbrück. And this whole time, her uh, uh, Frau Kirkman is like, you know, you need to tell them you're not Marta. You need to tell them who your dad is. You need to save yourself. And if you know anything about the Bible, you know there is a book called Ruth. And in that book, there is uh, a woman named Naomi, and she and her family are living in a land that is suffering from a drought. And so her husband is like, let's go to this other land, which to the Hebrews was a forsaken land. Like it was not somewhere they should be going, but he was like, this is the best place to go. I've already arranged wives for our daughters. And then... They get there, the husband dies, both of the sons die, but one of the daughters is Ruth. And she and Naomi have formed this bond to the point that she's like, where you go, I will go. Your people are my people, your God is my God. That's kind of the mentality that Lisa Lata has towards Frau Kirkman is, you're my mother, you're my family, Lucas is my family, like I'm not gonna desert you. I don't quite remember how long she's at Ravensbrook, but the this guard comes and he gets her and he takes her and uh, I, I'm, I'm unclear as to exactly what's happening or, or like how it's happening, but she's taken to this room and she hears the voice of a man who she thinks is her dad. But this person is like, yeah, I don't know any of these girls because I guess they rounded up quite a few girls who could have been Lisa Lata. In the aftermath of that, because so, yes, if you don't figure it out, spoiler-ish, her dad rejects her. And in the present, he tells Hannah, he didn't reject Lisa Lata. He rejected the family, the Kirkmans, that Jewishness. And now that she is a Kirkman rather than a Zomer, he, that is what he is rejecting. So the guard that had come to get her, he had been expecting some kind of great reward for finding the, the long lost daughter of some high ranking Nazi official. And when it does not come to pass, he decides he is going to get his reward in another way, and that is by rape. According to Lisa Lata, like from her perspective, it seems that only he did it. But then when Hannah meets the, the author, the speaker, she said that it was more than one guard. In any case, now we are wondering who really is Hannah's father. Is it Lucas or is it one of these guards? And it just, it raises another really good question as to how would you feel 
or if you were in Lisa Lotta's place, what would you do? Because this is not something I have come across in a lot of Holocaust novels, but at least according to the secrets she kept, I mean, and this is nothing new, you know, a number of women were raped. However, those women also could get pregnant. You know, of course, there's a certain point where they're so malnourished that their body, you know, things aren't happening anymore. So you, they're not getting pregnant. But women would choose to abort the pregnancy. Women would choose to basically kill themselves rather than go through the pregnancy. And so I just thought that was a really interesting perspective, a really interesting point that I, I didn't hear very much. What we learned, and I thought this was again really interesting. I, I do wonder how feasible it is, but she carried, obviously she carried Hannah to term. And she was only in that camp basically long enough, like nine months, maybe a little earlier, depending on how long she was there before she was raped. But it, it couldn't have been that much longer in that she didn't know if it could have been Lucas's or the guards. But, you know, the women kind of banded together and helped her get through it. You know, they would sneak her extra portions of food. They would get her medicine from the infirmary. They would help take some of the load off of her when they were doing their work. And, you know, obviously the human body can withstand a lot. That they could be essentially worked to death on very little nutrition. I thought it was thought provoking that these women would sacrifice what they already don't have in order to make sure that this baby survived and that Hannah seemed to be born normally. Like they're, they're, she didn't really have any adverse effects from being malnourished during gestation. Anyways, what happens is, you, you know, as, as the Germans saw the end coming, they started to try to get rid of Jews from the camps. And so Frau Kirchmann is, is taken away. We don't really know what happens to her. Eventually, Lieselotte's number literally is called and she is shipped off somewhere as well. So while there, she does find Frau Kirkman. But Frau Kirkman is at the point of death. And I think literally that night she died. And it couldn't have been much longer after that the, the camp was liberated. Because the story is that Hannah's father, father Daddy Joe, or whatever you want to call her, him, found Lizalata in a pile of dead bodies still holding on to the hand of, of a woman. So I don't, I don't really know what that time frame is, but then his story is that in order to get her the best medical care he could because she was pregnant, she needed to marry him because medicine for Jews was at a premium. Like it was just really hard to get good medical care. And so in order to get her good medical care, she would need to be under his medical care and then for some reason he was like all right now we got to go to the states i don't really understand all of this I, as i said with hannah's perspective it just all wrapped up really quickly and we're learning all of this from hannah's perspective but what we get is that basically lisa lata agrees in order to save her life to save the life of her unborn child and we still don't know about hannah's parentage but what we do eventually figure out is she locates Marta. And Marta shows her pictures of her own mother, of Frau Kirkman. And it's obvious that Hannah, which, if you don't know, Hannah is a Jewish name. It's a Hebrew name. So I guess we are kind of clued into the fact that Lucas is her dad this entire time. But yes, Lucas is her father. We do learn that Lucas did survive camp as well. But the fact that Lisa Lotta married this American GI compounded the toll that the camp took on his body. And so what he did is, you know, because Marta was like, she's coming back. She's coming back. I promise she's coming back. And it took her a lot to be able to track Lisa Lotta down because apparently Joe did his best in order to keep 
Lizalata away. I thought, you know, like, just the end. There was so much great stuff that really went unresolved by the end or just was unsatisfactorily explained. But you essentially were supposed to believe that for some reason, he just doesn't want to give Lisa Lata back. And he, at this point, Hannah is like four or five. And so now he's using Hannah against Lisa Lata, being like, well, I'm the guy on the birth certificate as the father. If you go back, you can't have Hannah come with you. And so Lucas saved up enough money to come to the States. And he does find Lisa Lata. It's, it's a very brief, vague memory of Hannah's, of, of this, basically this bum who is very similar to her mother, you know, speaks the same way, and is someone that Lisa Lata cries over, that she goes and she gets food from the store for him. We are led to believe that is Lucas. He did find Lisa Lata, but in the end, it didn't work out. He, and then he died. I, I guess he, he went back to Germany and he eventually died. That's kind of Lisa Lotta's story is she was in love with the wrong kind of guy. I mean, according to the Nazi party, she was in love with the wrong guy. She took someone else's place. She went to a camp while there, discovered she was pregnant, went through all this trauma. She eventually was rescued by an American GI who then basically extorted her into staying with him. And this is why she was so miserable. This is why she wasn't a good mother, was because she was so miserable. I thought Lisa Lotta's storyline was the stronger of the two. But I think it's also because it's actually the historical side of the two. I really enjoyed Carl and the way that he shed light on things for Hannah. Like when she met his parents because there was a possibility that his parents knew the Kirchmanns. And his parents were like, you know, there, there was a point where the I think I think it was the Kirkmans someone had delivered all of these passports to them because they knew that they were going to be rounded up and taken away and so they're like look like we're now relying on you to to carry on our work to get these into the right hands so people can be safe and they were too afraid to do what needed to be done and then they lived with that guilt by this point for 30 years so i thought he was a very key player in this book i don't think i would have liked hannah as much without him because i don't think she would have developed at all without him showing her that she's got it wrong. <laughs> she's not the almighty American. Also, getting her to look at her grandfather in a certain way, he kind of manipulates her into staying longer than she meant to. Because as I said, she came over during winter break. I don't think she returned until April. He basically manipulates her into staying because now he no longer has a housekeeper and now that she is his heir, like she can't just leave. And so he's like, well, you know, if you're going to get groceries, only go to these places. And Carl is like, so what are the names of the places he doesn't want you to go to? And you realize very obviously Jewish names. And so you're just like, huh, you know, I mean, like we knew something was funky was going on with her Zomer, but... Yeah, and I, you know, as far as Dr. Peterson, dude creeped me out. He was a really good antagonist. Again, I thought the resolution with him was just too quick. You know, it went from he and Herr Zomer kind of talking secretly behind doors and stopping whenever whenever Hannah was near, and you know, they just seemed to be bosom buddies to. After Herr Zomer has his stroke, well, Dr. Peterson is not actually his doctor. Dr. Peterson is not even on the contact list. So, like, who is Dr. Peterson to Herr Zomer? Because obviously Herr Zomer doesn't trust him. So, I, I, I don't get it. 
how he went from being a confidant to being someone who Herr Zomer wanted essentially nothing to do with. No explanation from Herr Zomer. I mean, even when he dies, Hannah and Carl come back from one of their penance expeditions. She goes up to see her grandfather to confront him about something. And he, you know, he's really weak. And then Dr. Peterson manages to get into the house. And he's like, oh, well, aren't you going to tell her the truth? And then as she's arguing with Dr. Peterson, her grandmother dies. So we get, you know, at this point, like, she's trying to ask him, what happened with my mother? Like, after you found out she went to a concentration camp, what did you do? And we never get an answer. I mean, we eventually get it through other sources, but it was like... I, I didn't understand the need for Herr Zomer in certain respects, but in terms of Herr, I mean, of Dr. Peterson, you just, you just want to deck him. You just, like, you know he's, he's nefarious, you know he's up to no good, but you're kind of helpless to stop him. Even in the past, me with my, I'm not Gen X, I'm not Millennial, Whatever generation I am with my my mentality from being born in this certain era and growing up with certain information, I'm like, dude, you're wrong, but you can't do anything about it because in the 1930s and 40s, he's not wrong. And that's a really interesting point, actually, because when it comes to this loot that Hannah is trying to return, Carl points out to her, like, Dr. Peterson can get you in trouble because now that you are Herr Zomer's heir, you are basically an accomplice. You are now part of this. So if you're not careful around him, he can go to the police and you can get in trouble because you own the house. And, and it's just really interesting because you're like, but she didn't do anything. Like he did it 30 years ago, but you know, at the time, like he, he still can't get in trouble because at the time it wasn't illegal. And it's, I guess, technically still not illegal. They didn't do anything wrong. They were doing what was correct or like politically correct at the time. So it's just, this book was so great because it really shed a light. For me, it created an awareness of different aspects of the Holocaust that I'd never considered before. So I, I recommend it if you want to listen to the audiobook. I, I say go for it. I found it much more impactful when I was reading it for myself, but I think that's going to be the case in like 98% of audiobooks. I love this book. I would give it a, probably a four and a half stars, maybe, maybe more like four, just because the end was disappointing for me. I thought it just wrapped up too quickly. There were a lot of loose ends that were never answered sufficiently for me. But there we go. I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you later. Bye.